Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Debbie Davis, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, and I am really happy to be here tonight. Thank you, Jim and the committee, for inviting me. Um, I, it's just nice to see so many old friends and so many people that I know. And, um, you know, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous, whether you be new or maybe you're sitting here and it's been, like Leo mentioned about this fellow, a long time since he'd been sitting in a meeting. I, I welcome you to this way of life because that's what it is to me. Because I used to think Alcoholics Anonymous is simply just stop, you know, don't drink and go to meetings. And while that is in the basic fundamentals of some of the activities we do, and by the absence of alcohol, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has a place to work in my life, and I have some comprehension about it, I wasn't interested in doing anything anyway any that required any kind of effort, and this is what I whittled it down to, and I could call it I was a member of AA or going to AA, and all I was doing was bringing abstinence and sitting in a chair. I wasn't trying to connect to you. I wasn't trying to be a part of you. I just simply thought this is all that I needed to do, and then everything would get wonderful, and basically I would get below your radar is what I was really attempting to do. And so what I'm about to share with you tonight is, if you are new, is what my journey has been here. And they encouraged me all along when I first was introduced to you to find the similarities, but I knew I needed to find the differences because I didn't want to be one of you. <laughs> and so, you know, that's all I knew how to do. So I, But I want to encourage you to find the similarities as we walk this path. And... Many years ago, I finally hit my bottom. And to me, I've heard so many of your stories, and this is applying to mine too. And in my case, bottom was not an outside event. It was an inside job. I'd had lots of outside events happen that anyone could have pointed, as certainly my family did, pointed and said, God, can't you... See what you're doing to yourself. We're picking you up out of jail again. This is so humiliating to our family. Look at the trouble you've caused here. Look at another job, another job, another. And, and the, the, the most they would basically get out of me was, was an audible, uh, you know, I mean, just, there wasn't, <laughs> oh, uh, that, that may be. But it, the point being is that I, it never got below my eyebrows to connect. I did not care. I had no conscience for a long time. This night, I finally hit that bottom that to me lies two inches behind my belly button, where I am finally sick of me and my action. Everybody had been sick of it for a long time, but I'm finally sick of me and my action. And I and I don't want to keep living this way if this is the way it's going to look. And there's a lots, there's lots of ex, uh, uh, words that have been used to describe that I, I'm done, uh, surrender, desperation, give up. I've had it. I've, I've hit the bottom. They're all correct. They're all correct. Mine, I think I would describe as just a silent resignation. It was like the last bit of the helium out of the balloon. And it just... Pfft, and I was, yeah, I just <laughs> pootered out. And, um, and I, there was this window, this moment of a thought that came into my head, and it wasn't even an answer to a prayer because I didn't say a prayer. I just knew that inside I had just flatlined. I zeroed out mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. Just zero. And the thought came into my mind that those people in AA seem to know what to do. I had visited you for 10 months. The first seven months, I did the bare minimum, which was one meeting a month. That's all I was required to go to. 
And then I bumped it up to one a week. You know, so I was really going to a lot of meetings, you know, and my, <laughs> just shocking. And, um, and so I went to this weekly meeting that I had been going to. This was a Saturday night. I went to this meeting on Sunday. And I started from that very night, that Saturday night, as I look back, the, the, the path I got on began to turn that night. First of all, the thought, and I would listen to it. Sunday comes around. I don't take anything at all during that day. I go to the meeting that night, and I got there early. Okay, now, I'm somebody who likes to get to my home group 45 minutes early because I love to watch the meeting come alive, and there's, there's lots of people at my meeting at 45 minutes before it starts. But at this time, I'm one that comes in when it starts. I leave when it's over, and I've got AA done, okay? And I had that attitude for a long time. And so now I'm, I'm arriving to the meeting 20 minutes beforehand. Now, that's like the equivalent to me of dri arriving the day before, okay? It's just like, <laughs> who gets there 20 minutes early? Well, the old timers do, you know, because the people I'm running around with, the meeting hasn't started yet for them to come in. So I'm uh, getting there, like, really early. And... So that was the, another thing that I changed. And the, this was the key, is I asked a question. I don't ask questions. When you're Miss Know-it-all and Miss Self-Righteous, you don't ask questions. Because you're full of arrogance and ignorance at the same time. I was. And I asked a question, and it would be the question that would change my life. And I said, what do you do to stay sober? The important thing was that was the end of the question. There wasn't going to be a debate on my part, a reply of, I don't like those steps. Now, I mean, the fun ones, you know, pick out a few fun ones. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, there wasn't going to be any reservations anymore or conditions on whatever it was that you told me. And that was new. Because I'm somebody who's basically lazy and I don't want to do anything and I want you to do it for me, give it to me, handle it, whatever. And that wasn't going to be the case. I don't know what you're going to tell me, but your life is so infinitely better than mine. Because when I came in here back to you, I knew I was coming in here with dead eyes. And I looked at you and your eyes were alive and bright. There's a couple places in our literature, especially Bill's story, about Ebby's eyes. And he, he, they were different. And so were yours as I was seeing you. You had a grounding about you that I would come to understand was the relationship you had developed with a power greater than yourself because you took the steps. And you just, you just had that piece about you that I did not even know how to spell. It was so foreign to me. And the series of things that they would tell me would become not, not something that I could possibly do the first week, month, year. These would become the, the, the guide poles of the way I want to live and how I live my life today to the best of my ability. They continue to be my ideals to grow toward. And so the very first thing they told me is that one day at a time, we don't take the first drink or anything else that affects us from the neck up and we get a sobriety date. So if you are new here tonight and you don't have a sobriety date, I really encourage you to get one because Alcoholics Anonymous will make a lot more sense when you're sober. Just a, just a suggestion, you know. It really makes a difference. And I took that day as my sobriety date, which was February the 8th, 1976, which means I've been sober 36 years and two days. So that's a, that is fun. But it also means that I got sober when I was really young. You know, I, I was like five when I got sober. You know? You know, I'm, I'm from the Midwest, and we start early, we get her done, and we move on. You know, we just take care of business. But I was young. I was 18 years old when I came to you. So I have never had a legal drink of alcohol, and I hope I never do. But that doesn't mean that I didn't have to do then or now the same actions everyone else does to stay connected to a God, to stay active in service, 
to remember my obligations and responsibilities as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not all about me and what I'm going to get and how convenient it is. I have responsibilities here as a member, and I take them very seriously. But I also realize that I am fully 100% responsible for my physical sobriety. This is where it starts. This is what I take chips or cakes for. It's physical sobriety. I'm really glad they don't take it on spiritual progress, you know, or uh, sanity of the day. Um, so I'm really glad. It's just that, but, but that is an important aspect, and this is the one thing in my life that is non-negotiable on honesty. So for me, that means it's really clear. I don't, I don't drink near beer, okay? I don't smoke near pot. Um, <laughs> I don't drink health store speed, okay? <laughs> I, I, just, I just know myself in my mind. I am an alcoholic perfectly described that I love the effect produced by alcohol. And the, you could have pointed that out to me the very first night I took a drink, and I wouldn't have understood what you were talking about, but it totally described me right dead on. And so this is how I begin each day as I ask, with the book ends of prayer, is I ask God to help me stay sober today, still after all these years. I don't take it for granted. Please help me stay sober today. Relieve me of any obsessions I may have, because I don't know about you. I have never had a good obsession. <laughs> you know, I have never obsessed about eating more vegetables. It's just never happened. It's... It's always some resentment, some little gnat's eyelash of a hurt, you know, that just explodes. So I, because when I'm obsessed about it, people, places, or things, what happens is that I am useless. I am no longer useful because I am so within myself. And so I ask to be relieved of any obsessions and to show me how you want me to be of service today. I back that up by staying, saying the step three and step seven prayers because that backs up my offering myself to God to use me today as you want. And also I have some enjoyable readings that I, uh, I like. And at night I close my day with the book end of prayer because it is important for me to just, this is the only day. This is the day that counts. And to, to fulfill it as best as I can. Some days are going to be brighter than others. But this is how I do my day. There's lots of things, of course, in between. But so I ask God every day to help me stay sober. Now, in order to comply with Tradition 3, which is the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking, I needed to have started drinking. And I know in some areas in my, my where, I, where I live, it just doesn't seem any matter anymore that, that, we, that you haven't drank. And to me, it does matter. I, I'm not going to relate to someone who's never had some sort of a drinking problem. And so I got here because of my alcoholism. I took my first drink when I was 12 years old. I was uh, raised, as I said, in the Midwest. My parents are not alcoholics. It's been decades since my mother's had any kind of alcohol. My father used to enjoy a drink now and then. But alcoholism was nothing, nowhere in my, our family. Oddly enough, nowhere in my husband's family. And so it's like, where did I get it? I have no idea. I don't know if I was born an alcoholic. I was, I know I was selfish and self-centered. I was an only child. Their world revolved around me and I loved that. You know, I, but the problem was I thought everybody else's should as well. And, uh, I just had been invited by the cool kids in school on a Monday night to this upcoming party on Friday night. And I was very excited to be a part of that group. I just simply was 12 years old and wanted a little group of friends to hang around with. That's nothing odd or unusual. And I heard them talk about drinking. Again, I don't recall them talking about being drunk, but drinking. And I decided that Friday morning that... I had two thoughts on my mind. One was what I usually woke up with, which is be a good daughter, obey the rules, you know, stay out of trouble. I'm somebody who does really want to live in a harmonious way in this world and, and do the right thing. But the second thought was, I'm going to get drunk tonight. 
Now, I have no idea that these two thoughts are going to come in direct conflict with each other. <laughs> I have no idea how you get drunk, but I figure you probably have to drink a whole bunch. I looked at this night as my debut. I mean, I was, it was in a lot of ways, uh, but I looked at it as my initiation to being accepted by these kids. So I've got to do it up right. And that night, about 6 o'clock, we're... I, I can remember it as if it was tonight, because it was a Friday night. And this, uh, we were passing around your 12 and 13, it's like a liquid potluck, you know, whatever you stole and borrowed and parents and, you know, God, really God only knows if possible what was in there. But we're passing around this brown bag and a bottle in it, and I don't know what's in it, I just know it's alcohol, that's all I need to know. And uh, it got to me, and I'm acting like I do this all the time, when you're 12, you try to be cool. And it gets to me, and I took a big old pull off that bottle, and I gave it to the next guy. The problem was, is I was totally unprepared for the, what that was going to taste like. <laughs> I mean, it caught my breath. It just ripped out my throat. I am just speechless. I'm doing flip-flops on the inside, but trying to act cool on the outside. <laughs> And there, but there came this thought behind all that, which was quite calming. It was, don't worry. You can always get another throat. You know, just go for it. You, you're good. You're good. There was not a question whether I would take the second drink. That was a given. And a few moments later, when it went down and hit my, that, bottom that we talk on the inside it went in my gut it was like hot lava it was just warm and thick and quiet and it filled in every hole in my gut and I didn't even know there were any because I wasn't running away from a horrible home life violence abuse neglect no, nothing of that sort these were kind caring cookie bacon lawn mowing church going tax paying kind of people <laughs> they were so responsible and but I've had a drink of alcohol, and my world has never felt this way, and I can't wait to have the second one. And while there was no big parade that went on, my shoulders relaxed. And when that bottle came around the second time, I want some more of that feeling, maybe a little bit more, so I'm going to do the same thing. And when it got to me, I took another pull off of that, and I gave it to the next guy. My throat's a little seasoned now, so it's not as, you know, ba banged up. And when it went down the second time, if there is this line we cross between social to alcoholic drinking, I just pole vaulted over that thing, <laughs> okay? Because I was transported into another world I wanted to be in all the time. I liked that world. I, I took my first drink simply to be accepted by you as drink number one, please accept me. And drink number two was, who needs you? You know, I mean, just <laughs> bam to bam. And, and drink number two was the launch. And so I developed a lot of patterns that night. These patterns do not make me an alcoholic. Some of you in this room have had one, two, or three, all of them. Some of you not. These aren't what make me alcoholic, but they would be patterns that I never grew into. They happen night number one, so I didn't think they were odd. I, I blacked out for the first time. I didn't know what a blackout was till I got to you. I, I just didn't realize that I was still functioning with no memory of what I did. I passed out. Uh, I thought I took a nap. Um, in a way, sort of kind of did, but it wasn't by choice. And, um, and then I came to with my first case of the dry heaves, and I thought it must have been something I ate that morning because somewhere in that week I heard if you don't eat, you will, you'll get drunk faster. And so it must have been something I ate that morning. Now, I'd never had those three things happen, and I'd never been drunk before, but they were unrelated. In my mind, they were unrelated. And I could not wait to drink again. And this all happened in a short evening. What makes me an alcoholic is what I read in our literature as the two primary symptoms. And that is the mental obsession and the allergy that are different for me than my parents. The mental obsession is easy to me to, for me to explain because I told you Friday morning I woke up with good ideals in spot number one and get drunk in spot number two. Saturday morning, they're in reverse. 
And I wake up thinking about drinking, I will for the next several years. And how to get it. My night changed in so many ways. Where I spent my money, where I spent my time, who I hung around with, what I would do, changed that very night. The other thing was, is that the curtain of care closed. I just stopped caring about things from that very beginning. I didn't know that. But my emotional interest level in life just closed. The only thing that was important to me was alcohol and, and, and the pursuit of that. The other thing was is the, the phenomenon of craving, that allergy we have. I don't have any other kind of allergies, and so I don't have a relationship or understanding of that till I got here. And I didn't know that when I took a drink, I took a drunk. I always intended to get drunk. I was obsessing about getting drunk before I'd have my first drink. When I took it, there wasn't ever an option whether to take another. It was game on till whenever. Till it was, till it was over, till I, when was, something was over. And so it never occurred to me that other people don't drink like that because I saw you only through my eyes. And I assumed you do what I do. That's how I saw you. And so for me at 12 years old, it was on. And it, I drank at every opportunity I could create, uh, mostly weekends, but anything that I could possibly do. And a year later, I'm drinking whiskey out of a bottle with a beer chaser. Again, I don't think that's odd at all, but I did find I was blacking out far too quickly. I don't want to be sleeping through life. I want to be smack in the middle of it. So I found things to help keep me alert to delay that inevitable blackout. Sometimes it delayed for several days, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, I, I found my my assistance in speed and acid, and that's what I love to do. And I'll tell you, it will get you there quicker and in color. And um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm like, I found it, and. So that became my preferred combination of things. Um, and I'm now 16, I'm 4 to 16, 17 years old, and it's a, it's a daily thing. I mean, rarely does a day go by when I don't have, I'm not altered in some fashion, usually whiskey and acid, that's what I do. And it's as, you know, I've hit that, put that pedal down as fast as I could, but I don't think it's odd at all. I'm trying to wear all these hats, I'm trying to, be in school, I'm trying to work, I'm trying to, but mostly live my life around alcohol. Things are always going to revolve around that. And it, um, you know, I love hearing how it works because that first paragraph describes me in who makes it, who doesn't, why they do and why they don't. Beautifully describes it. And I wasn't willing to follow the path for a long time. And the other thing is in the ABCs and B, it says that probably no human power could have relieved us of our alcoholism. And if, if a human power could have, my father would have done it. And he tried all human measures. And finally, he sought professional advice because he did not know what to do. Now, when he told them my, my story as he saw it, they knew exactly what he had on his hands. And they suggested to him that while he still had legal custody, that he could admit me to a treatment program. And so when I showed up after one of those two-week vacations, the kind you're the only one who knows you were on one, you know, um, they're calling morgues and hospitals, and you're like, what? You know, I sort of knew where I was most of the time kind of thing. And you're looking for money. And again, you don't care about anybody but you. The selfishness is so deep. And they lured me over to their home, and uh, one more time, I'm in the back of a police car, but for a different reason. I was taken to the station, and I was court committed by the judge to uh, a treatment program for alcoholism and drug addiction. I'm 17 and a half years old, this little town uh, in Grand Forks, North Dakota, that I went to this hospital in. And I went there on a Friday night. So I had my first drink on a Friday, and I'm going to be introduced to you on a Friday. Fridays really are my favorite night of the week. And... Uh, <laughs> And so I love being here. So I began uh, this process, and I really I didn't have much of an option. Leaving, they find you, they put you back in, or something worse. So my attitude, as I said earlier, was just get under your radar. 
and they would take us to outside meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd never heard the word alcoholism. I'd never heard the word Alcoholics Anonymous, sobriety. Those were really unknown words to me. Um, I'm not illiterate, but they just weren't in my circle of conversation. And we would be taken outside meetings on Friday nights. Um, and, of course, I would sit in the back of the room as far back, because I, I think you can catch alcoholism in these rooms. And, <laughs> and so I'm going to protect myself, you know, from that. And as a friend, Oren, in our area says, I sat behind the paint. You know, I totally relate to that. I want to just be behind the paint in that room. And, but they would have people doing what I'm doing tonight. They would share their story, and they would encourage me to find the similarities. I've got to find the differences because I don't want to be one of you people. And so I would hear you say things like, uh, I lost my family because of drinking. And many people have lost their family, and they haven't come back. But my smart aleck attitude didn't think about that. My attitude was, hey, I've got one you can have, you know. Um, <laughs> They're always talking about my drinking, and this would alleviate that. And, and, be, and yet I, that was up here, and yet I knew in my gut where I really lived, that two inches behind my belly button spot, that it had been necessary for me to leave their home because they no longer had a safe place to come home to. And they never knew if it was Jekyll or Hyde there. And I really un related to that story in our literature. They talked about uh, totaling out cars. And I was the designated drunk driver of my group of girls. I had two other girlfriends. I'm happy to report that one is sober and a member of the Pacific group, Karen's home group. The other one did not make it. She did for a while, and a couple years ago we laid her to rest. So now she has her permanent sobriety date. But I'm uh, driving these three, us three around because they couldn't drive sober, let alone drunk, so naturally it was left to me. And, and I, uh, I was, we drank and drove. And uh, when my attitude was, you know, I have never totaled out a car officially. Um, <laughs> although I had a little drunk car that arrived here. You know when you buy them, there's, they start off rectangular, okay? <laughs> and then when you drive like I do, they, they get rounded out with the drunk bumps and somebody else's car and, you know, ditches because we live out in the country area and, you know, ditches and all that. And, and then uh, you've got things falling off. They're missing. The window had been shot out of it. And um, my gas cap was a mitten I had stuck in there, okay? I mean, I'm like driving a Maltoff cocktail around, basically, you know? I just... But I'm telling you, it's like, they cost money, you know? Gas caps cost money. Mittens work. Ah, uh, makes, makes total sense, I know. So... They, so I justified that one away. They talked about uh, losing jobs. And I had a series of little jobs because I, you know, I can't keep them. And I, I, you know, I'm one of those people, great starter, looks good on the gate, but just kind of, you know, f fades to black. And, <laughs> and I had this, uh, I, I was let go from a couple jobs. I quit before I was let go from a couple jobs, but... The last year, uh, you know, I just had this bad habit. I guess I was trying to be responsible or something. I'm not exactly sure, but I would quit in a blackout, okay? <laughs> this is a problem because I'd just go to work the next day, you know. <laughs> and uh, we're all, everybody's surprised, you know. They, they're, you know, the, these are such awkward moments that you just don't have the words for, you know. So this was what I was working with um, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, this kind of thinking. And then, and then there were a couple that you really, you really, I just didn't know why you had to talk about those. And you talked about all those broken promises. And I thought, how do you know about those? You know about them because you did them. And I realized I hadn't been able to keep a promise since I was 12 years old and took my first drink. Because all was part of that promise was, and be good. And we all knew what that meant in our home. It was don't drink or take any drugs. 
and I could go almost two weeks. It was always that second Friday that tripped me up. I just couldn't get past that second Friday because, you know, I don't know, I have alcoholism. I have no idea. I'm just holding on, holding back, hanging on, whatever you want to call it. I don't have the ability to get get very far. And it would start all over again, and I did not understand that until I came to you. The other thing there was a woman who talked about trying to scrub away the smell. She caught my attention. Because I've had this funny odor for about a year, and I don't know what it is. And I've tried to puff and powder and perfume it away, and it's still there. And, and, and I, she knows what the smell smells like. And she says she's an alcoholic, and she doesn't drink anymore. And I'll tell you, I've been a lot of 12-step calls, and that used booze fragrance, <laughs> I'm just glad it's not on me anymore. <laughs> I'm glad it's not on me. And my attitude was as close as I got, and that was that if I'm not careful, I might be one of those people. And so I was sent to an all-women's halfway house in Minneapolis. That's how I got down there. And I would um, be, be, I didn't like women, so they thought it was a good idea to send me to an all-women's halfway house. It wasn't my idea. And I would be there, and I was planning to just be there three months. I would be there a total of nine months. And I said, I said earlier, the first seven months, all I did was don't, drink, don't take any drugs. That's kind of a no-brainer in a recovery home. People are trying to turn their life around. I mean, please, come on. And um, go to one AA meeting a month. And that's all I did. I I had the, I'm not going to two. I mean, like, join AA or I, I, no, no, we're just going to get under the radar. I came to California, went to San Jose, visit my mother for a two and a half week holiday. First week I'm miserable because I'm hanging around the people I used to drink with. Last week and half drunk and loaded with them. No surprise. Not even to me. Because somewhere in those early days, I heard some words that were the, to the effect of, your actions, and this includes today, your actions today are either on the road of recovery or they're on the road of relapse. Which are they? Now, I can lie and cheat and steal in private and have some secrets, and I can fool you, but I live with me two inches behind my belly button. I know what I'm doing. And that doesn't appear to be recovery behavior. And those first seven months, I'd, I'd give AA a bone, you know, I'd go to a meeting and stuff. But I, I kept all those old phone numbers and visit all those old friends, see how they're doing. I kept that wide open. I gave this no, no glances beyond what was required. So it was no surprise at all. But the surprise was that alcohol wasn't doing what it used to do. Within a few drinks, I will recall being just somehow going into that blackout for the next week and a half. It was in and out of blackouts. Luckily, I was with people who cared and took care of me. But it was nothing but a blur and lights here and a light there now and then. And on that flight home, I drank on the Western. Western used to give free champagne, and I thought, well, might as well. I'm still not of legal age to drink it, but I think, you know, we'll work that out. And I drank on the way home, and I had this attitude change of I've learned my lesson, but it was just an attitude. It never got below my eyebrows. And I decided to step my meetings up from one a month to one a week because that that sounded like a really good thing to do. I still don't crack open that book or get a sponsor, do anything but attend one meeting a week. And again, arrive when it starts and leave when it's over. And five weeks later on a Friday, I got a letter in the mail from one of these California friends that had one joint in it. And I decided to keep it because I thought, well, you know, you just never know, when, you know, when you might need something like this. I had no idea I would need it the next day. You know, I just, I just did not for, yeah. Shocking, I know, yeah. You know, I lit up when I saw that thing. I thought, my God, you know, I started plotting and planning and maneuvering and manipulating, and I wasn't going to tell anybody because. You know, I don't want him to mess up my mission. I was on a mission to do that, and I set out, and I planned it, and I, uh, you know, one more time, that secret, that secret before I went to California, knowing that I will drink again one day. I don't know the when or the where of it, but I will. I didn't tell anybody that. I didn't tell anybody about this one joint, and I just figured, you know, it's none of their business. It's just one. They shouldn't count. In my world, one counts. One pill, one beer, 
one shot, one joint. It counts in my world. And I smoked that joint that Saturday afternoon, and I had no idea that that would be the last thing of any mood-altering thing I would take until this moment. I didn't plan that. I had no plans, actually. They were zero plans. But I look at that as you, my, my driest martini is how I look at that. And my sobriety date is based on that. That's the last thing to this moment. And so then that's when I had that bottom. I had that silent resignation, and that's how I got my sobriety date. The first three things that they told me about sobriety date, a home group, and a sponsor became a personal triangle for me, that when those were in place, everything else seemed to come together as well. Literature studies, reading our book, taking the steps, service, et cetera, et cetera, all of that came into place under that umbrella of the three of the sponsor, so sobriety date and home group. In Alcoholics Anonymous, our fellowship, we have three legacies. The legacy of recovery, it says that it's recovery, it doesn't say sobriety, it says recovery, which totally changed the way I looked at this deal. The legacy of unity, our 12 traditions, and the legacy of service, our 12 concepts. It's important for me to apply all of those in my life. It's a 36 point program to me. Because I need everything this fellowship and this way of life has to offer. I need it all in order to live the way I get to live today on the inside. And so I got my sobriety date. The next thing they talked to me about was we go to a lot of meetings and we get a home group. I have had, I I go at a minimum of three, usually four and five meetings a week still at, at this time. I have had uh, four different home groups because I've lived in four different parts of the country. And when I realized I moved up here and to Concord uh, 11 and a half years ago, I realized that I've also had four different last names, okay? <laughs> so it just kind of worked out that way. You know, every city had a different last name. They're, they're all legitimate. Um, <laughs> And my home group is the primary purpose group in Dublin, meets Thursday nights, 8 o'clock, an open speaker meeting. And if you're ever in the East Bay, please come see us. It's a grand group. It's grand. It is full of electricity and life, and it's involved in all the service legacies. It's involved with, with just giving and carrying this message. I love being a part of that. Now, I, I live in Concord. I drive about 25 minutes or so to Dublin. For some of you, you know, Driving a long way isn't much. I'm not, it doesn't bother me at all. In my area, though, most people have like a five-minute window about where they go to meetings. And so I'll get questions like, well, gosh, isn't there something a little closer than Dublin? There's a lot of good meetings and even some good groups in this area. But I have no problem driving 25 minutes for an evening that I really, really enjoy, that I can count on for solid recovery, that we're focused on all three legacies. Because I compare that what might seem inconvenient to others compared to what I was so willing to do for drinking. Okay, I mean, I remember being willing to drive an hour and a half on the rumor there was a party going on. I don't, I don't have an address, but I'm going to drive, you know. <laughs> Let's go. I have no problem doing that. You know, and a few weeks ago, I was asked to talk at a 6.30 a.m. Friday meeting. Some of you, that might be noon for you, but to me, that is really early, Okay. <laughs> Because I don't go in with a baseball cap and jeans on. I go in, you know, dressed. So it takes a while. And um, <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I keep thinking, how can I get out of this? I mean, this is really early. And I kept... And I never could come up with anything, like maybe I could get sick at the last minute, but I I never could come up with anything that I could sell myself. How could I sell it to anybody else, right? And then i that's my first thinking. And then the second thought was, now let me just ask you something, Deb. If that was the only time that you could get a drink, or if that was the only time when you could meet the boyfriend, would that have been inconvenient? Hell no, you know, God no. I mean, I'd been there a half hour early, you know, so I have 
to compare what am I willing to do for my recovery that I was more than willing to do for my dying. I want to have this amazing life day after day after day, but it doesn't come without effort. It doesn't come without me being present for it. So this is how my home group, I love it. I love having a home group because it, in a home group I taught, was taught how to be accountable, how to be a part of something, how to be in service anonymously. I don't have to be the mid, big deal or the middle of the room. I, I just need to be in service. I don't, I am such a taker. You taught me how to give. I know what it's like to be in the room where it's uncomfortable. I know, uh, you know, I, in, in my one home group, the prior home group I had before now, there was a period of time when that marriage would come to an end and it was me and the soon to be ex he and the brand new she. You know, we were all in the same home group. Nobody got custody, okay? <laughs> and even though there's 250 people there, it can be really tiny, really small, really quick. And my guideline for myself was, first of all, the reminder that I only have one purpose, Tradition 5, in a room of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that is to carry the message. I'm not there to find a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a job, a place to live, a loan, a car, nothing. I have one primary purpose, and that it was important to me. Those newcomers needed, you know, didn't need me nearly as much as I needed them. And to work the room in that fashion, which I do anyway, but this was very intensified. And that if I knew where they were, I wasn't doing my job good enough for me. Because I needed to keep myself in the right frame of mind to take the importance of my, whatever my personal problems are, that the group's welfare always comes first. And that tradition one was a very important for me that it was applied because this has got to be a safe place for everybody. This is the last stop for most people. And I don't want anything I might do or say to cause them to not feel welcome here or wanted or want to come back. And so it was important for me to know how to participate in business meetings and apply those traditions in my life. They, I don't know about your home group, but I know in every one I've had, there's always been one or two people that I know would be happier in someone else's home group. You know, I don't, I don't know if you've ever had thought that, but I just know these things, okay? I never tell them that. I never, I don't don't tell them. I just keep that to myself, this knowledge. But what I've learned is that, you know, of course, I'm the common denominator in all that, but that I have learned in these rooms how to create a harmonious environment with the tools that we're given. I can do it anywhere. If I can do it in the rooms of AA, I can do it anywhere. So a home group, a precious, precious gift. They talked to me about sponsorship. I've had three awesome sponsors. My first sponsor, Marguerite, uh, died with 43 years of, 45 years of sobriety a few years ago. My second sponsor, Joe in Atlanta, died with 53 years of sobriety. They both had sponsors till the day they died. And my current sponsor, again, a member of Karen's home group, Millie G, 42 years sober, and she and I have been on the sponsorship path together actively for 25 years. And it's an active relationship because I'm an active part of it. I am not a stranger to her. Um, I uh, want to have somebody who knows all about me, the beauty marks and the warts, the secrets and the the good deeds, because I don't want to keep secrets from anybody. And um, I find that this relationship has given me a guideline, and she's been a phenomenal example to me of how to live this as a way of life in all of my affairs. And so I also have the privilege of passing this on. And for myself, I believe in passing on all three of those legacies because I want the women I work with to be fully informed. They may never use some of this stuff, but they know where it is. Because when I was a few years sober, I was finding out about things. I thought, now, how did I not know about that? And I don't want the people I work with to have that kind of ignorance by just by default. I want them to be educated and, and know about all of our legacies. And so that's a lot of fun to watch them grow and change in that. They talked to me about we take the steps. And to me, it was about incorporating each of the steps into my life 
This is why it's a way of life, a program of recovery, not just me bringing abstinence to the table. And so to begin to take those changes and take on those new things, make that inventory. And when I was, I would be seven years sober when I really felt as if in the first time I was really taking them. I had done them earlier, but kind of as best as I could. And, but at seven years sober, I took them again as if I had never seen or taken them before. And I got through to a lot, through a lot of those things and really felt a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. I made some amends. I, uh, actually, I had uh, not, it wasn't a long inventory, but it was the most revealing. It wasn't that I had not wanted to do it before, but this time it just, I had more experience, knowledge, understanding of what this was all about. And I made the last of the amends that had been lingering for a long time to my stepmother. And it was really an interesting experience. I only had a post office box. I lived in Georgia. She had lived in North Dakota and no listing of a phone number and can't seem to find. So I write a letter of amends. But I do, I am listed in the phone book in full name, not Debbie D. And um, <laughs> so I'm findable. And I ha knew that this was the one of all the amends I have to make. I have to go into this one with forgiveness. This can't be anything short of a hundred percent forgiveness. And then I can, I knew I would finally be free of making that amend as best as I was able to do it. About a month later, I got a call out of the blue and I recognized the voice right away. And it was her. She had located my number, be calling information, and I realized that um, two things. Number one, I was I was free when I heard her voice. My gut didn't go. I I knew I was free, and that she could be whoever it was she was. But the other thing that I real I really realized from that amends process was that what I had recalled the hurt actions I had done. Those weren't even on her table. She had quite a laundry list to share with me that I, honest to God, did not ever recall doing or saying. But I realized her value for her to maybe begin some healing process for her. And so I apologized for, for whatever harms I had additionally caused her, and we went on about our way and so forth. So a few years go by, and I'm back in North Dakota, and uh, no, about, about, about eight years go by, and I'm back in North Dakota where she lived, and I had heard she was dying from colon cancer, and she might not make it till Thanksgiving. And I was there in early November, and I just thought, you know, I'm not one of the people who needs to be there and do this drama and bedside manner and all that, and she should just simply be around the people who love her as she exits this world. And so she would die, and I would get a call that she had died. And uh, this, her half-brother calls me to say, did you know she was uh, sober 10 years? I'm on full alert. I've got antennas up. I said, what, did she have a sponsor? Where'd you go to meeting? And he said, well, no, she was pretty private. She didn't really tell anybody until she was five years sober that she was in AA. Okay. But here's what happened to me is I started clicking back the time. Hmm, eight years ago I made those amends. She would have been two years sober. Oh, well, that's interesting. Hmm, I wonder why she, why, why she didn't make amends to me. Uh-huh. And the good news of it was is that that was never an issue for me. That was never an issue whether she ever made amends. I was free. They were no longer needed. It wasn't ever needed. And that I don't, I don't know what kind of a program she had or worked, but I knew looking back because it was never expected. It was natural for me to kind of think about that and put that timeline together, but I was free. I had been free. And so I, I knew if I could forgive her, I can forgive 
anything. And that is always one of those bugaboos for me. It's one of the hard things for me to do over a hurt. I don't feel like I get hurt very often, but when I do, it's a real tough one for me to get over. But step eight and nine are very, very good about forgiveness. So anyway, they talked to me about those steps. And then when I got to 12, it wasn't about start over, Dad. It's about <laughs> step 12, get your butt out there and carry the message to those who don't know there's a way out. It's not about more introspection and learning about me. I'm going to learn about me by working with you, by giving this to you so that you know there's a way out and you get to live a different way of life. That's where step 12 comes in. It was That's what our pioneers did. They didn't keep looking at themselves. They were out carrying this message. That's what I'm supposed to do too. They talked to me about those traditions. They said, you know, they're not just for the group. But why don't you learn how to apply them in your own life? Why don't you learn how to personalize them? And when I began to do that, it was really amazing that I gained some tools that I never, ever had on how to be respectful of you, self-supporting, group conscience instead of Debbie's way. The common welfare was important. Uh, Anonymity, attraction rather than promotion. All these kinds of things, outside issues. It began to be so helpful, whether it was a relationship one-on-one or a friend or parent or whatever it might be. Those traditions became the best tools I've ever been given. They talked to me about service. To me, service is in my home group and regular meetings is a given. That, that That's a no-brainer. For me, though, the service I do outside of the group level, the inconvenient stuff, that's the stuff that really makes me feel alive whether it's an H&I panel, whether it's general service, which is what I'm involved in now, whatever it might be. There's bridging the gap. It's that stuff that makes me feel really participating in my life and in my recovery. And so service has been very key for me. And then to carry the message. You know, I uh, my 36 years here, my first four years I was in Minneapolis, And I was in the middle of you and felt so alive and like in the sunlight of the spirit. And I moved to Atlanta and I felt that I knew something now. I got four years and um, I think I'm going to, you know, seven meetings a week is an awful lot of meetings. I think I'm going to trim that back, get a little balance in my life. I about balanced myself out of Alcoholics Anonymous is what happened. I went from seven meetings a week in a super short time to two meetings a week. So that's two nights with you, and five nights with me. (laughs) It's not balanced very well. I didn't have plans for community service or education, or I had no family to take care of. No, it was just me. And my world got really small to the point where at six years sober that I've taken a cake and I am absolutely miserable and miserable. My solution, though, was that people, places, and things are going to make me happy. Now, really, the wording was called men, money, and mansions are going to make me happy. Okay? Let's call it what it is. So I'm on a mission. And and I I met this old fellow about three weeks later on a Friday. And uh, so it's an omen, right? Uh, he had all the things I was looking for. He'd even had been sober 13 years, hadn't been to a meeting in three years. No problem. I'm going to help him. <laughs> and what happened is the light switch of insanity got flipped on inside of me. And I, I was as crazy as crazy can get looking in myself in the mirror and knowing I'm crazy and can't stop it, don't, know, want, don't want to stop it. And I am behaving in a way that I'm not proud of and doing things I shouldn't be doing. I'm keeping those secrets. I'm ducking and dodging, and I'm, I've, I'm in that darkness. And at, uh, after three months of this whirlwind romance, of which I was the only one involved in. <laughs> God, I hate those kind. Um, <laughs> this little guy got married to somebody else. <laughs> so I let him go, and... Um, <laughs> it's amazing how, how they pop up in a different form again. So a few weeks later, up pops another little fella. We do this 
dance a delusion for three months, and off he goes off marrying somebody else. And, you know, I finally uh, hit hit a bottom at, at nine point, 6.9 years of sobriety. I just came crashing back into you again. And I, I zeroed, I flatlined inside emotionally, mentally, and spiritually one more time. And this is when I made the recommitment to Alcoholics Anonymous that I've kept for the last, since I was seven years sober, 29 years. And I have been on that path at 110%. And what that looks like to me is I know all the things to do. It's do a little bit more. That's the cushion. That's the cushion that keeps me from rounding down that 100% to 99.99. And so I began this journey at eight years sober. I'm feeling just a twinge of restless, irritable, and discontent. And then because I'm a regular in my home group, a guy's talking about feeling that way. And he said, you know, I realized I was trying to live today on last year's program. That's the only thing I heard that man say. I was eight years sober, and I thought that's exactly nailing me right where I am because I, I don't know where else I am, but I'm not in this day. He gave me a new look at what one day at a time looks like. This is the day that counts. This is the day we have the reprieve. I don't get a weekly reprieve or a monthly reprieve or every anniversary or birth, AA birthday. I, I re-up one more year. No, I re-up when I wake up. That's when I re-up is every day is the daily reprieve. And he really gave me a new vision on that. I was, I said, I got married. I moved to Southern California. That marriage would come to an end. And I needed to take a look at me because even though it's easy to point fingers, them, 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 they, 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 I really do have three pointing back at me. And I needed to take a look at my own inventory to realize that I know absolutely nothing about being a good partner. That all I was bringing to the table was selfishness and self-centeredness. And that really doesn't have a long life of interest for the other party. So I found that uh, I needed a lot of changing to do. And I, that if God did have some, somebody else in store for me, that I would have something to contribute instead of just be a taker. And this is at 17 years of sobriety. So again, I'm not a quick study. I'm, I did not start this thing and end it perfect or anything like that. I've told you those goals and guidelines, guideposts that they gave me at the very beginning. But I'm certainly the first to admit my flaws and defects are alive and well. That, but I have the tools today to keep them, keep them in check. And so I began a different journey and that it, this phase of my development, I'm, I would, I'm learning how to be perhaps a partner to somebody. And eight years later, although we have two different stories about this, this, I, I got the microphone, okay? So <laughs> I would meet my husband, Kent. I, he lived in Concord. I lived in Long Beach and we met in New Orleans. There you go. So we're at a conference and, uh, as things would turn out, six weeks after later, we would go on our first date, just kind of hang out for the weekend, and we never looked back. It was one of those things where we both knew. And I would move up here in August of 2000 to Concord, and, and we married in April of 2001. And what a fabulous journey. I mean, I, I just can't imagine walking this path with anybody else. I mean, we're not hooked at the hip, but we love the journey we get to live together, and we have our own responsibilities of our individual journeys. And it's just a joy to, to walk this path with him. And, and I do like the fact that I'm sober longer than he is, too. You know, that <laughs> that's fun. You know, I like that part. But anyway... Um, for our one-year anniversary, we're back in Atlanta, and this is the last of the people and the places and things that are important to me that I want him to meet and see. And so we're Friday night, we're back in my old home group, and it's exciting and fun. And Saturday morning, we're, uh, I say my prayers, please help me stay sober today and relieve the obsessions and so forth. But I'll tell you, this was kind of a weird thing because we would go to that luncheon that day, and there was a group of people. And when we went in to sat down, sit down for lunch, there was pre-poured wine on the table. Now, I was not prepared for that. I'm 26 years sober at the time. I'm, I'm used to being around alcohol. I mean, I don't hang out in bars. I, I know how to turn my glass over, say no thanks. I don't need to recite Chapter 3 to them. You know, so they, they don't really care. Um, no is fine for most people, except the drunks, you know, like, uh, so, um, so, so there's this wine. So I'm, I confirmed the beverage, and, and it just was 
I just moved it out of my reach. Now, I don't remember, like, smelling it. I don't remember anything like that. But what this event would cause for me would be the, a six months chemical craving for drunkenness. Okay? I don't know how else to describe it. It wasn't a mental obsession because if there was any mental obsession about it, it was stay safe. Stay grounded, stay safe, stay close. But it was, it was this crazy kind of this chemical imbalance occurred. The only real way I can describe it is, is like, you know, women with chocolate. Yeah, that's, that is serious. I mean, when we crave chocolate, lemon meringue will not cut it. Okay. No, no. It's, it's so kind of serious with us. It's like, give me the chocolate <laughs> and nobody gets hurt. Okay. And that was how this craving was. And it was really driving me into such fear and concern. I'm like, why isn't this going away? I started, you know, I'm trying to explain it to my sponsor. I don't even know how to describe it. And I started looking back because I was getting scared that I would maybe one day kind of go into a Stepford mode, you know, and, and drink against my will. And I was really, really scared about this. And I started looking at things because, you know, so many times people pick up a drink in another form long before they pick up the drink. They pick up a resentment, a secret, a, a relationship, a money, got to catch up, got to get, got, not, got this, like, Leo said, got things going on. This guy's got family and got the job and got it all going on. And one day, none of that's working anymore. And I got to find relief somewhere. And I used to find it with a drink. And I started looking at that. I'm not doing any of those things. I'm not lying, stealing, cheating, doing inappropriate behavior. I don't have any secrets. I'm active in sponsorship by with my sponsor, with others, active in meetings, in service. I'm not shortchanging or cutting anything. Why is this happening to me? I am so in the middle of you. My relationship with God is strong and fresh and current. It wasn't like, whoa, hey, you better start praying again, or you better get to meetings. It wasn't that. And it was terrifying me. And finally, it's six months have gone by, and I don't, I don't know what to do, except what I've continued to do and all the things that I've done over the years were continued on. And I was in a meeting one morning. I'm feeling fine. The meeting's over. I'm on my way home, and I am gripped with the terror that I would drink against my will. And I, um, I was, I, I've never been so scared. And I called my sponsor. I mean, that wasn't even a question who I should call. Another good reason to have a sponsor is that I didn't, well, should I? No, there, uh, I don't want to be debating on a life and death question. Who should I call? That's why a sponsor is so vital and key in my life. One of the many reasons. And I called her, and by the way, I dial her number. I don't speed dial her. I don't want to lose my phone and not have us, you know, use that as my reason. I, ca I can't find my sponsor's number. It's in my phone. It's laser beamed in my head. If I'm ever in a coma, I'll be able to give her number and my husband's number, you know, so I'm covered. But I called her, and I explained what was going on, and she said what I've heard many times. It wasn't like I'd forgotten this. It just was the way it was said in the fresh coat of paint it was presented with. She said, honey, what we have is the disease of alcoholism, not alcoholism. And one more time, I, for the first time, it felt like I got to start to exhale. I am not doing anything wrong. I am not defective. I have an illness that will always be with me. I need to be ever respectful of it and mindful of it. And I started to go back into that memory of that daily reprieve we talk about. And it says, we don't get it because we're cute. We have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And I know that if I had not been connected to a power greater than myself, there would have been those brownouts. There would have been a weak, such a weakness in me that I would have, you would have a different speaker here tonight. But the other thing I remembered the most is back in chapter three. And it says that 
we are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period of time, it gets worse, never better. My illness did not fade when I stopped drinking. Oh, no. Many of us have said it's doing push-ups back there. It's still right there, just waiting for that weakness. But it wasn't going to win. My God, the relationship I have is bigger than my illness. But if I'm not with that God on this path, it will be a struggle. And I don't like to struggle. If I am in the grip of a progressive illness, then I had better be in the grip of a progressive recovery. I cannot afford to rest on my laurels. I cannot afford to just pat myself on the back of what I did a day ago, a year ago, a week ago. That just got me to what this day has given me. And this day has given me a chance to be with you on this journey. And uh, let's have one more day of reprieve. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.